Good morning, church. Pastor Matt here. Just want to welcome you to this week's online church service. I'm so glad to, for us to come together as a family to seek God together and worship in a need. Um, we do have some announcements for you this morning, uh, but most of them will be down below. If you scroll down in the description of this video, you'll see more announcements. Uh, but I do have two things for you before we get to a time of worship through song with Pastor Jonathan and the band. Um, the first thing is another wedding to celebrate. More great news amidst a lot of this uncertainty in the COVID-19 season. But many of you know the Moriarty family. Bruce and Diane have been um, faithfully serving here for a while. And their, their son, Birch, got to marry his love, Heather, a couple Saturdays ago on May 30th. So that's fantastic news. Um, if you can reach out to them, have ways to encourage them and congratulate them, we think you should. Um, so 
Birch and Heather, congrats. So happy for you. Um, next, I want to take some time to have a bit of a weighty conversation um, together as a church. I want to be honest this morning and come before you with a bit of unrest on my heart. Um, we need to spend time together this morning in prayer and in recognition of the immense hurt and turmoil that has been taking place these past couple of weeks in our country. As most likely many of you know, our country has been in a place of disorder after the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the surfacing of that, that horrific video in Central Park in New York City. I know that we live a bit removed from where these events really affect people deeply and a bit removed from where these protests against racism are popping up all over the country. But I do want to encourage us to not take this lightly. As people are hurting, specifically people of color. And it's a reality that hurts some of us immensely more than others. And we do want to keep talking about this. And if you were pained by our silence last week, I'm, I'm sorry. Silence on injustice is not where the church should be. So the sad reality here is that sin is still very present in our society and evil is prowling. And it hurts all of us to avoid it and to ignore it. But we do have a hope. We have the gospel. And if anyone should be leading the charge and being on the front lines on these conversations about racial reconciliation, it should be the church, as we are empowered by this hope. And I have confidence the Lord is working on this in us. So when we read God's scriptures, it's pretty clear to us that our Lord is one that is near to the brokenhearted, to the oppressed, and to the poor of spirit. He is a king that has said, that he will bring justice and restoration for all things. But church, I just need to lament with you. Say, I'm tired. I don't have the right words to say. I don't really know how to feel. I don't know why a lot of this is happening. I don't know why we have to continually endure these kinds of unjust murders that make too many people in our country feel unsafe. I, like many of you, hate this. This isn't the way things are supposed to be. And I recognize that I'll never come close to understanding what our black sisters and brothers deal with on a daily basis. And I can't come close to relating to that anguish and to that fear. So even with very little to say or even to feel, I do want to point us in the Lord's direction as that's really our only source of hope and deliverance and perseverance and all this. See, we as students of the Bible, we can see that God is clear on his stance in all this. See, he made every single one of us in his image. And he opposes anything that will force a different narrative on that. In other words, he adamantly opposes anything that dehumanizes a person, an image bearer. See, racism is felt in too real of a way by those of color. And I want to humbly start in this place of recognition See, his identification with how our kin feel, and ultimately with how our Lord feels when he watches, this identification through the lens of the gospel leads us towards righteous action. So, in that vein, I want to lead us in, this morning in a time of reading from the book of Proverbs to challenge us and to encourage us as a church. So, here's what we're told in the book of Proverbs in chapter 31. Verse 8 and 9, it says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth 
judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. See, this is, this is a call for us as humanity, for us to oppose injustice, to speak up, to grieve with those who grieve, to weep with those who weep. Because church, this is, this is the heart of our God. His heart is to see each and every one of his sheep brought back to the fold and to flourish. So now I want to take some time for us to, to pray together. Even though we're still physically apart, um, and I do recognize that praying in these kinds of times might be hard for some of us as we're spent and we're tired. I hear you, and I get that, and I long for your restoration in that as I long for mine. But I do want us to seek the Lord together, even in this fatigue. Because as it tends to be, um, that it's in these times of desperation on our knees that we really feel him hear us and come close to pursue us. So we're going to do a little bit of guided prayer together. But before we do, I do have two last things to challenge us with. First, I want us to commit to this level of dialogue and communication because we need to keep talking about this. We need to keep seeking to understand and to continually pray. See, this dynamic of seeking God's justice and gospel transformation for the whole world is not something that just cycles in and out as the headlines move from calm to pain and back to calm. See, we want revival. And we want the gospel to end suffering. And we want God to bring his grace and mercy. So basically, let today's time of prayer not be the end of all this. And second, I want us to seek to listen and grow. So our, our church, I recognize, and our city aren't really dripping with racial diversity. So I encourage you to seek out black voices um, to sit under striving to grow and understanding and empathy. Um, so if you need help finding some of those, we place them down below in the description. Um, some video links that um, I would recommend to watch, to hear from people with a different perspective and to hear how they're feeling and how they might be hurting. These are just a few suggestions, I'm sure, and a, a sea of helpful voices to, to listen to. So now I want to lead us in a short time of prayer. Um, the way this will work is we'll put up a prayer prompt on the screen and I'll read it out loud. And then you'll have about 30 to 45 seconds or so to, to pray either to yourself or with your family. So we'll put up three prompts over time. And then after that, I'll close this out in prayer. Um, so if you have at least three people in your house right now, uh, we encourage you to consider having one person pray for each thing. Or you can collectively choose to pray silently together. It's up to you. So I'll give you a brief pause uh, to prepare. And then we'll start putting the prompts on the screen. So let's pray together. First, pray for those in our country that are hurting and for the hope found only in the gospel to reach them. Second, pray for an end to racism and for a gospel transformation to take root in this country. And lastly, pray for 
leadership to lead well for those leading our churches and our states and our federal government. Thank you for praying. Um, I'll close this out. Sovereign Lord, we come to you hurting and desperate. We come to you tired and on our knees, begging for your light and life. We come to you longing for change and for the peace that really only comes from you. Father, we, we, we yearn for you to return. And like the psalmist before us, we, we ask how long will it be like this? How long will darkness prevail? How long before you send Jesus again to restore all things? So we're tired of seeing names like George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor and more and more in, in our news headlines, all for the wrong reason. So we beg you to show your mercy and to bring healing to those feeling the weight of this more than we can understand. Father, please bring an, an end to this seemingly unending string of injustices. Please, Lord, please rip racism out of this country's fabric. We pray for your comfort to reach those of color in Spokane in our church that feel unheard, undervalued, or afraid, or dismissed, or misunderstood. And Father, I pray for the church. Um, mold us into a family that seeks to celebrate and honor those different from us. And we want to see your creativity and diversity in creation as something to revere. And God, I, I, I long for the day when we get to heaven and see all races and tribes singing of your glory together in unity and unison. But while we're here on this side of heaven, Lord, um, give us the courage, perseverance, confidence, trust, wisdom, and just all the things needed to come together as a body a body unified by your Holy Spirit for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom work that you've tasked us with. Give us the means to love your image bearers as you intended them to be loved. And that's what the, um, the dignity that you, of your own bestowed glory. And Father, please miraculously transform us. Bring a gospel revival here that is unending and committed to seeking a dramatic change, one that shines of you to reach our city. All of this we humbly pray in your Holy Son's name. Amen. God bless.
is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger.
I've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. from 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and enduring it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore out our sins 
in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Good morning, Berean Bible Church. So glad to be with you again this morning to worship together. Uh, it's such a, a, a wonderful opportunity. No matter where you're joining us from, we're thrilled to have you with us. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at Berean. And before I go any farther today and really dive into our study of God's Word, I wanted to uh, give you a heads up about next week. Next week is going to be our Honor the Grads Sunday. We've got a handful of high school grads graduates. Uh, we do this every year. Uh, we had long planned to do this next Sunday. And of course, with the quarantine in effect, we debated as a staff, should we do it the same Sunday and, and try to do it in a different format and do it online? Or should we try to delay it? But at this point, we don't know how long we'd have to delay it, uh, and some of the kids may have left town, and we really want to spend this time together. So I hope that you'll make plans and join us for that next week. Uh, Pastor Mike is going to uh, bring uh, the sermon. He's going to interview the kids. You'll get to see some great pictures of them. So I hope that you'll join us next week for Honor the Grads Sunday. I'm really looking forward to that. One of the things that has happened with this quarantine is that a lot of people took up baking. Uh, you've probably read these stories, and maybe some of you have gotten into baking uh, yourselves. Uh, and uh, because a lot of people got into baking, one of the things that there was a shortage of was flour, um, and then there was a shortage of yeast, and so a lot of people were really getting into sourdough baking. Um, <coughs> we didn't really do that here, but I saw a recipe for bagels, and that really intrigued me for whatever reason, uh, other than I guess we really enjoy bagels in our house. Uh, we often have them that we buy uh, from the store, from a bakery. Uh, and so we like a, a good bagel. And I thought, I'm going to try to make bagels. And, and many of you know that bagels are a little bit different than, than a regular bread because they are both boiled in, in a solution and then also baked. Uh, so there's that extra layer of, and I just thought that would be fun to try. And so I set out to make bagels. The bagels tasted great. Uh, our whole family uh, really liked them. In fact, there were immediate calls from the other people in my household to make more bagels. But they weren't really right right. Do you know what I mean? Uh, the texture of them was not quite perfect, especially on the outside. They didn't really look like a bagel. So especially toasted and with cream cheese, we ate them up. But next time I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can do a little bit better. And so I made another batch of bagels and, and they did turn out better. And I was really excited. And I thought, well, now I think I've got what I need to know to make them even better yet. And I was really excited about that third batch then of bagels. And it actually took a couple steps backward. They still tasted great. We ate them all. Uh, and I've uh, continued to have requests from my family. In fact, they're probably a little upset at me because I haven't made any more bagels yet. Uh, but they just still weren't that, that texture of the surface. It just wasn't quite right. And I, I was having a hard time figuring out what I was missing and what I was getting wrong. Now, I'm sure you understand this, but just in case you don't, how would I know that I was getting something wrong? What was it? Well, the answer to that is easy, isn't it? It's because we know what bagels look like. Bagels are readily available to us. Again, we can get them at bakeries. We can get them at the store. Uh, we enjoy them an awful lot. We know what a bagel is supposed to look like, that nice, crisp outer shell and, and a nice, soft, chewy interior and, and, and what they're, they're supposed to be shaped like and look like, just all of these things. I, we have readily models and, and good comparisons that I can easily look at and say, well, this isn't quite right. But now I have something to shoot for. And so I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to make my family happy and try to make some more bagels. 
I want you to keep that in mind as you grab your Bibles this morning. We're going to go to the book of Philippians. And, and we talk frequently about the fact that we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to look like Jesus. We're supposed to imitate him. We're supposed to be reflections of him. And one of the most wonderful passages uh, in Philippians, and it's in chapter 2, and as I say that, I know so many of you already know where we're going, uh, which is wonderful. But I love this passage, uh, and I wanted to go and look at this today, because as we talk about what it means to look like Jesus, to be like Jesus. This, I think, is a really critical point. So in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to start right now in verse 6. So Philippians 2, verse 6, it's talking about Jesus here because he has said in verse 5, and we're going to come back to this, but he said, you should have the same mind as Jesus did, who, verse 6, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. <laughs> it's really interesting language there. Um, and I want to be really careful. When it says he, he, he was in the form of God, it's, it's hard language to translate from the Greek into English, but it's not trying to suggest there that, that he just appeared as God, that he was sort of wearing a God costume or something uh when it says he was in the form of god it really means literally he was god that was his form his his very nature some translations say in english his very nature was that he's god that was what he is and we have a whole host of other verses that 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 corroborate that if we have any confusion and so i want you to be really clear about that 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 he was God himself, but even though that was his form, even though that was his nature, he didn't consider that something to be grasped. And the idea there is to hang on really tightly to something, to, to not let go, you know, to be holding on for dear life even to this thing, which is a really interesting thing to say about Jesus Christ, that even though his very form, his very nature was God, he didn't consider that something that he needed to hang on to. In fact, what it says after that in verse 7, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And, and here again, when this language says the form of it, it's not as if he just put on a, a, a costume of someone, that he pretended to be human. I mean, we understand he actually became human. He took on that form. He emptied himself, this language says. In, instead of grasping on to this, he, he was willing to empty himself and took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This is this Christmas celebration that we talk about frequently, the incarnation, that here we have Jesus, fully God and fully man. And I do think it's an important distinction that, that when the Bible says here, when Paul writes to the Philippians that he emptied himself, he's not suggesting that he emptied himself of his godness, that he ceased being God. That, in fact, is part of the miracle that he remained 100% God and in addition took on 100% humanity. He was both. That's what's so miraculous about it. But he emptied himself of, of the prerogative to exercise those things which made him God in order to be obedient, which we're going to get here to. And so it says he was, he was uh, uh, verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, but not just obedient here. It says obedient to the point of death. And then Paul doesn't stop there either. He says even death on a cross. And that's important to point out here because while we understand it's a very cruel form of punishment, it also is a form of punishment that was save for just the most heinous criminals in their society. I mean, if you really wanted to make a public show of how horrible somebody was, you know, this is what you did, and that's why he says, not just death, even death on a cross. This is, 
the extent to which Jesus Christ humbled himself, to which Jesus Christ emptied himself to the point where he, he didn't grasp and hang on to so tightly that which was his by right. The fact that he, that he was God in absolute nature, that even that, that he was willing to, to let go of. And he goes on to, to say in verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is Jesus. This is our model. This is like a perfect bagel. (laughs) And as I'm trying to to recreate the perfect bagel like i can look at pictures and even hold an actual bagel and say this is what i'm shooting for right this is jesus for us and this is one of those things that that he has this character that even though his his very nature was that of god he is god that he didn't consider even that something that he needed to hang on to real tightly, but was willing to empty himself, to become human, to humble himself, to become obedient, even to death, even the death on a cross. This is Jesus. And so again, as we circle back to this, because the context here, as we alluded to before, is this verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then that whole bit that we just read, who, even though he was God, did this thing. Have this mind in yourselves. And in fact, I want to back up even a a little bit further. If we back up another verse to get the full context here, because Paul, as he's writing this letter, he's, he's talking about unity among the believers. But here in verse 4, he just says very pointedly, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then he paints this beautiful picture. Here's the example, see? Here's the perfect example of that, of what that looks like. There's another verse uh, that puts it maybe even more bluntly. This is also a letter written by Paul, but back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 24 says this, Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Isn't that something else? Let no one seek his own good, but instead the good of his neighbor. And here again, even though it's not laid out explicitly in this context in 1 Corinthians, the reason Paul can write that is because our perfect example, our model, is Jesus Christ, who did just that, who instead of just looking out for his own interests, did exactly the opposite thing. He looked out for my interests. He looked out for your interests. He served the interest of every man, woman, and child alive. That's why we can get these commands to don't even worry about your own interests, but worry about the interests of your neighbor. We have been going through so many things this year as a as a country, as a whole world even. Our culture has been thrown into great turmoil. And I think throughout a lot of this, there has been a lot of talk about rights. And I think of that, you know, with with regard to this whole quarantine, which has been annoying. It's been inconvenient. It's been, frankly, really difficult when, when we hear things about the uptick in cases of mental health problems. That's a real struggle. We're We're having a hard time with this. But throughout all of that, There oftentimes is this cry, sometimes on our part, you know, that this isn't fair, you can't tell me what to do. Sometimes it's something very simple, 
There are certain stores that have said, if you're going to come into our store, we're going to require you to wear a mask. And some people have gotten really angry about that and said, you can't make me wear a mask. And it's sort of, you know, baked maybe into our DNA, even as Americans. We have a history that we're proud of, of of really being rebels and standing up and taking up arms, even if we have to, to protect our rights. But what I want to suggest to you is that is not the model of Jesus Christ. Just to think about that simple example of masks. There's been great debate, I understand. But let's just, for sake of argument, say that you're a person who doesn't believe that masks do any bit of good. And again, just for sake of argument, let's say that you are 100% correct in that. Even so, is it that hard to put on a mask to go into a store rather than fighting about it? See, this is the model that Jesus Christ sets for us to not be so worried about his own rights, to not consider even his deity, his godness, something that he had to hang on to, but was willing to empty himself of that. I think that you and I should make it our goal to be as exactly as concerned about our own personal rights as Jesus Christ was. I want to say that again. We would do well to be exactly as concerned about our own personal rights as Jesus Christ was. That's a hard message for us. I understand. I'm not going to suggest that it's really simple. And yet, as we think about what it means to be followers of Jesus and what it means to be imitators of Jesus, that's what it looks like, is to endeavor to be exactly as concerned about our own personal rights as Jesus Christ was in his own life. But furthermore, you see in both of these passages, both in Philippians and in 1 Corinthians, that there's not only this sense of don't strive for your own rights, but to look out for others, to look out for your neighbor to look out for the people around you and of course our perfect model of this is jesus christ too it's in that same passage in philippians the reason that he came and was obedient to death even the death on a cross was for you and i it was for the whole world and now we are called again as as this verse in first corinthians just says so pointedly let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor how do we seek the good of our neighbor and sometimes that's as simple as putting on a mask even if we think it's silly and we think it's unnecessary to say oh it's okay i'll put this on for my neighbor for the people around me it's okay sometimes maybe that's more serious you know we've been struggling again it it makes my heart ache but we've been struggling again in our nation with the fact that we have this issue of racism still going on. It it might not be legal per se, but it's still there. We're still seeing a whole group of people in our country, our neighbors, many of them our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, who are crying out and saying, We're afraid. We feel disenfranchised. We feel cut off. We feel less than. And frankly, we're afraid. We're afraid for ourselves. We're afraid for our children. We feel like we can't trust the people who are there to enforce the laws of our land. We're afraid and we're tired. How do you and I endeavor to look out for the needs of our neighbors. How can we do that? See, this is the example and the model of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who even though he was God, was willing to set that aside for you, for me, for everyone else. 
And so what does this look like as we talk about being Christ ones, as we talk about what that means to imitate Christ, to look like him, to behave like him? And I want to suggest this is a huge one for us right now. And we've got some some particular opportunities that are going on right now in our culture to either shine and to be a beacon of this or to not. And I want to suggest that this is a great opportunity for you and I to model Jesus Christ, to look like that perfect example and to say, I'm not even going to worry about my rights. Instead, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to think about and focus on it and have a concern for the rights, for the, the, the welfare of my neighbors. And especially when we have people who are our neighbors. They might not live next door to your house on the same street, but we've got our neighbors in our nation that we have a great opportunity to look out for. And when we do that, we become like Jesus to them. We model that love and that grace. When we don't do that, then we don't. I'm not sure what we're modeling, but it isn't Jesus Christ. Now, if those are hard words for you, I'm sorry, and yet I'm not really sorry because this is God's word to you and I, that this is how we are to behave. So again, if you and I can be exactly as concerned about our own rights and our own welfare as Jesus Christ was, we'll be doing great. And if you and I can be exactly as concerned about the welfare and the rights of other people, our neighbors, as Jesus was, that is when we really start looking like Jesus Christ. And that's where we're supposed to be. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you so much, as we so often do. And we never want to get tired of thanking you for your immense love and your grace and your power, your mercy, all of these things that are so praiseworthy and you are just the perfect example of all of those things i thank you for jesus christ who is our perfect model and as we strive to be like him we thank you that we have your word revealed to us and we can open this up and and read it and and not just say in some nebulous vague way let's be like jesus without understanding what that means we've got some really clear examples that make it really pointed what it looks like to imitate Jesus Christ. And in this, God, we pray that you would convict us. We pray that, especially with some kind of unique opportunities in our our country and in our neighborhoods right now, to look like Jesus Christ that we would be precisely as concerned about our own rights as Jesus was. And that conversely, we would be exactly as, as concerned about the welfare of others as Jesus was. God, help us to imitate Jesus Christ. Convict us when we're not doing it. We confess, God, we miss the mark. But help us to continue to look at that model again and to try again, to try a new batch of bagels and to do it better. God, thank you for our salvation. We thank you that this is freely available to everyone who will accept what Jesus Christ has done on their behalf. No matter what background, no matter what status, what their previous life has looked like up to this point, no matter what, that Jesus says, I offer you this gift I paid the price for you. I humbled myself to death, even the death on a cross, because I love you, and I want you to have the gift of salvation. Receive this gift. And Father, we pray for everyone who's with us this morning, 
and for everyone who is in the sphere of influence of all of us who doesn't yet know you, that they would understand that simple but powerful truth that salvation comes because of what Jesus Christ did and to accept that free gift that you've provided to us. God, we thank you. We pray you continue to bless us, to build us up, to mature us as followers of Jesus and make us better and better imitators of him and that the people around us would see that. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Berean Bible Church. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful week and come and join us next week as we honor our grads together. Grace and peace be with you.
forward to that day. Thank you so much for your promises that we can rely on. Lord, you are so faithful. You always do what you say you're going to do, and we look forward to your coming. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.